Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you all today. And um, I should explain why I'm not in uniform. Um, that was the first question Tracy asked me. Um, is I'm actually at my parents' house in Okaboji. So I'm here in Iowa, actually, since I'm teleworking um, full time for CDC. Um, you know, I kind of had the opportunity to, to, to travel somewhere. And um, I forgot to bring my uniform with me. <laughs> so anyway. Um, but great to have the opportunity to speak to you and um, and great to be back in Iowa. Uh, I'll be talking to you today about the public health response to COVID-19. I've been working on the response pretty much since the beginning. Um, I am working more on the environmental health side of things, which I'll get to later on in the presentation, but did want to start out by um, you know, um, talking about the human aspect and animals, I figured you would be all very interested in the animal cases, which um, uh, Casey Barton Baravesh very graciously loaned me some slides from the One Health office to share with you all. And then I'll be talking about our environmental health response. So to start out, um, you probably um, know about coronavirus is a large family of viruses. There's actually four subgroups, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Um, and the, the SARS-CoV-2 that, that we're dealing with now is a beta, um, is a beta uh, subgroup. And, you know, in addition to people, it affects various animals, you know, uh, as you've already heard about, I'm sure. And then, you know, we're familiar with coronaviruses and veterinary medicine, especially feline infectious peritonitis and others um, all fall into the coronavirus family and don't infect humans. And then some examples of zoonotic diseases from the past are SARS and MERS. I did not have the opportunity to work on MERS, but I did work on SARS. That actually happened while I was an EIS officer um, back in 2002. And um, let's see here. So you, you all know about the emergence in China, I'm sure. Um, and it being associated with live animal markets. Um, and, you know, the first cases in the U.S. were in January 21, um, although now it looks like they may have identified some earlier ones through genetic testing. And uh, you can look at any of the COVID case reporting on the CDC website at the link at the bottom of the page. And um, there are actually this is the basic surveillance page. There's actually also one called COVID View, which has a quite a bit more detail if folks are interested in the breakdown in racial, you know, racial and ethnic breakdown, you know, the, those sorts of things, uh, how many people have different types of, um, uh, what's the word, risk factors, uh, underlying medical conditions is all there. Um, so uh, feel free to take, take a look at that. Um, animal source. So, as I mentioned, this being a beta coronavirus, it's similar to MERS and SARS. All three of these originated in bats. And so, um, that, you know, seems to be the, the animal reservoir that seems to have uh, the best luck of having a mutation that allows for infectivity with humans. You know, but of course, how exactly that happened isn't, you know, isn't known. Um, and then, you know, how it spread, there's still, really, it's still human to human. There's no evidence of, we haven't seen anything anyway, about ingestion or, or even surfaces, honestly. And I know a lot of the guidance still is protecting against surfaces, and it's, I think, more of a theoretical concern rather than actually in the investigations that we've been doing haven't really found um you know uh that that was the only possible way you know a person got exposed um it's, it's generally people are being exposed to other cases um and you're familiar familiar with the symptoms as well um it has been a little bit interesting that um, you know, the complications associated with it, as far as pneumonia, respiratory failure, multi-organ system failure, 
I mean, it's definitely a little bit different from influenza. I think in the beginning, people were doing a lot of comparisons to influenza, and as time goes on, we're seeing more and more differences here. <clears throat> Particularly the multi-system organ failure is quite different. I mean, people are not generally, their lungs are not filling up with fluid and they're drowning essentially, which often happens with influenza. So um, it really is, I think there's still quite a bit to learn about the exact disease process in the body and how that affects um, both the recovery and um, prognosis. Um, uh, I I don't remember. Okay, well I'll just keep. <laughs> I just don't know why I can't see the Q and A. Is are there? Hold on. I Jeremy, I can't see the Q and A. I don't know if there's. Anyway, I'll just keep going. <laughs> uh, uh, at the top of the PowerPoint so where you're sharing, the, you should see the uh, uh, sharing, uh, stop sharing. If you mouse over that, it should drop down a little window to give you options to see like questions and answers and chat. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. thank you. I'm used to you being betcha. on the bottom. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yep, no yeah, problem. Okay, there's, there's none up there yet. Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep looking at it periodically. Thank you. Um, so now I'm moving on to the clinical signs in animals. Um, you know, this is what we're aware of so far. You know, there really hasn't been that many cases in animals. Um, and, you know, certainly some animals can be asymptomatic, similar to what we're finding in humans. Um, so, getting, delving into some of the published scientific articles about animals. Um, animals that can be experimentally infected are non-human primates, cats, ferrets, and golden hamsters. And if you look down here on the right-hand corner, one, two, three, four, these are the articles that these are referring, what those numbers are referring to. And then animals that cannot be experimentally infected include pigs, chickens, and ducks. So you, there's a lot of research going on in this area, and I'm sure this will continue to change and grow, but uh, but I'm impressed with how much uh, scientific literature has been able to get out already on this. Um, now I'll talk about some about the positive animals globally. So the first one was a dog in Hong Kong back in February. And, um, and then another one dog in Hong Kong in March. And you can see some of the details about these different things uh, if you want to take a look. And then um, the cat in Belgium, um, and you know, going on around. The first ones in the U.S. are over here, with um, where you can see this tiger, and then the tigers and lions. And that was at a New York Zoo. And I do have another slide that talks a little bit more about it. And one line, uh, the initial tiger was confirmed by USDA, and then there's a lion as well. So um, you can see that there. And then since then, we've had a couple more uh, cats in the US, and these were confirmed by USDA and VSL as well. And then since then, there's been some minks in um, the Netherlands. So, um, and OIE is keeping track of all this data and so you can look at it, um, look at it there. Um, I've got a question here that says, um, according to the National Response Framework, the lead federal agency for any significant biological outbreak uh, will be DHHS, and more specifically, ASPR. Why hasn't ASPR been on the news or on the presidential panel? Okay, good question. Um, ASPR is very much involved with this response. Um, for whatever reason, they haven't been on um, the, you know, on the press conferences with the president that much. Admiral Gerard, um, who is the head of the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, it has been on there some, and so he generally is representing ASPR, um, I would say, but certainly behind the scenes and all the meetings that we're in and things, uh, ASPR is very much involved and, and we're communicating with them um, on daily. 
Um, and then the next question is, uh, have there been any qu cases with equids? And I have, I'm not aware of any. Um, so, but like I said, I think we're still just in the beginning phases of starting to identify um, animal cases. All right, next slide. Um, <clears throat> Confirmed cases of SARS in animals in the United States. So this is just going into a little bit more detail on what was shown on the previous slide. So like I said, um, it's really just in these four animals, the uh, tiger, lion, both at the same zoo, and then two cats. And um, those have been reported to OIE. Um, let's see here. Uh, the next question is what assay methodology is being used by USDA labs to confirm animal suspects? I don't know that. I'm sorry. I'm not, a, I'm not involved in that aspect of things. So thanks. All right. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about the uh, large cats, um, these were um, all at the same zoo in New York, as I mentioned. Um, there were seven that developed respiratory signs, and then one tiger was asymptomatic. Um, and uh, the remaining seven cats were positive in fecal samples. And, um, and here's kind of an update that all of them continue to do well, and they're behaving normally and eating well and their coughing has been greatly reduced. Uh, and they do believe that the cats were infected by a staff person and be, or before that person developed symptoms. So, and I guess I didn't say that so far, but that's uh, predominantly what we think about these animals being infected is that they're being infected by humans that are um, positive for um, COVID-19 and then they're subsequently being infected by uh, humans. We haven't seen any evidence of them transmitting from, um, you know, animal to animal. Um, here's a little bit more detail about the pet cat. So you can see cat one with sneezing, ocular discharge. Um, cat two, sneezing, coughing, ocular and nasal discharge and lethargic. Um, the, the first one is a little bit less clear how they were exposed. There was no individuals in the household, although they lived in a community with a high incidence and the cat was an indoor outdoor cat, so may have been exposed outside the home. Um, so yeah, that one is a little bit unclear. And then the second one, it, the, the cat's owner was positive for um, COVID-19. And there was another cat in the household that um, showed no signs of illness. And both cats have recovered and are doing well. Um, here's uh, some information about the dogs in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, these had happened a little bit earlier than the US cases, as I showed on the timeline previously. Um, so you can see some information here. Um, one was a 17-year-old Pomeranian, and the other a two-year-old German Shepherd. Both, um, both of them, their owners, were confirmed with COVID-19. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about bats in the United States. So there is no evidence that the virus is present in any um, free-living wildlife in the U.S., including bats. As you can imagine, that's a particular concern, um, considering that we believe that you know bats are the original animal reservoir in China, and so there is quite a bit of bat testing going on, so that if if it were detected in bats, we would um, know about it right away. Um, and we're you know not yet aware if this new coronavirus would even be susceptible for any of the North American species of bats. So anyway, more to do on the ecology front. This is really, will be a very interesting um, frontier of science over the next a couple of years, I'm sure. So just to kind of summarize about animals and COVID-19, um, at this time, it doesn't appear that animals play a significant role. Um, as I mentioned, they're, the animals that have been sick have primarily been infected by um, people, humans who are known to be infected or later known to be infected. 
Um, and so, um, you know, some of this information can kind of guide us in what sort of uh, preventive measures are needed for vet veterinarians and other animal handlers to be very helpful. Um, and, you know, uh, but I don't have a slide about that, but uh, this is, I think, just the general um, protect yourself in a slide. <laughs> um, but um, I know NASH has produced quite a bit of guidance already about what um, what PPE folks need to use, so that that's a really good source of information for that sort of thing. Um, let's see here. Um, I've got another question. Has there been any cases of animals transmitting to humans? No, not that we're aware of, and, and definitely continuing to monitor for that. All right, so this is kind of the general protect yourself and other information, which I'm sure you're all familiar with at this point about social distancing and, you know, avoiding close contact with people who are sick, wearing cloth face coverings, um, all those sorts of things. Um, I know we've all been up close and personal with these things lately. So, you know, social, but social distancing, it still tends to be the crux of a lot of the guidance that we're providing. It does seem to be very helpful to maintain a six foot distance from others and really reduce your risk of um, becoming infected. And, um, and because of this guidance is what sort of leads to the others about mass gatherings and schools and you know telework and things. So, and I, I know you're all living this day to day, so I don't need to go into too much detail. But there is a, a whole, quite a big group within the CDC Emergency Operations Center that is producing these um, guidances um, and that I've been pretty closely aligned with and so I'm familiar with the work that they're doing. And it is a yeoman's task to um, identify all the, any place where there's gaps in guidance and getting that put out. So they're really um, doing a, a great job there. And then cloth face coverings. You know, this was a little bit controversial, you know, when it initially came out, but um, has turned out to be a critical uh, recommendation, something that I think we're just starting to have a view of now that this is probably going to go on a lot longer than we initially thought, both the social distancing and the cloth face coverings. I know as CDC, as we're starting to talk about returning people to work um, in the next a uh, month or so, you know, that any any time you're not in your immediate office or cubicle, you know, and out in any public space, including hallways and, you know, restrooms and break rooms and things, we'll, we'll need to wear cloth face covering. So it looks like that's going to be with us for um, quite a period of time. Um, and we, we've we got some, you know, do's and don'ts here. And we did get the children under two don't you know not recommended to have face coverings for children under two added and that partly came from uh our partners with the pediatric environmental health specialty unit um, that we work with um, across the country um, so next slide is about protecting your pet um, I thought I had a new question, but I don't. Sorry, one second. I'm gonna close these so that I can keep track of my questions. Okay. Uh, so protecting pets. So this goes along with the human guidance that I just shared, and you know what we know so far about transmission between pets and animals. Um, so not letting pets interact with people or animals outside the household. You know, we've kind of talked about maintaining your bubble. You know of your immediate family, and that includes your pets as well, and keeping them from other animals. And same with keep with cats, keeping cats indoors, and you know walking dogs on leashes um, six feet or less, and you know um, away from other people, and avoiding dog parks and those sorts of things. So. Um, you, they, these are just kind of the logical guidelines, I think, that follow from what we know about this so far. 
And then um, what to do if you're sick. Uh, you know, I think everyone's probably pretty familiar with this at this point. And I think it'll be interesting to see because the census numbers were actually quite down in emergency rooms and um, hospital, you know, admissions. Um, and, you know, we have some evidence that people were delaying seeking care, um, you know, when they probably should have. And, and now with the states opening up a little bit more, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the hospital bed counts and everything. So um, that'll definitely be something to monitor over the next, um, the next week. And then what to do if you're sick and have animals. So, I mean, definitely if you have someone in your household with COVID-19, you know, it's good to restrict contact with both people and animals um, as long as that person is symptomatic. And, um, you know, uh, if your pet does get sick and you, and you know that you have COVID-19 or you suspect that you do, you know, definitely alert the veterinarian to that um, so that they can take precautions before they see the pet. Um, and this slide is just talking about staying healthy around animals. Um, you know, the, just the practical things about maintaining good hygiene and cleaning up after pets. Um, you know, and all of those sort of things. And keeping in mind sort of the vulnerable populations that we've been concerned about with um, COVID-19. And so here's a number of resources um, about pets and, that you can take a look at. So both from the CDC website, USDA, FDA, um, the AVMA has, a, has quite a nice website, um, the World Health Organization and OIE. So those are kind of the main um, uh, organizations that we would normally think of there. So let me just check here if there's things, if there, I realize that there's some questions in the chat box here. Let me just look real quick. Uh, let me see here. Uh, why cloth, cloth masks instead of disposable? Are disposable going to be allowed? Um, yes, so both, I think the concern was just about the, the surgical masks were, that they might be in um, short supply similar to the N95. And so, uh, you know, the cloth mask was something everyone could make at home and use themselves. So, um, and I, I think there, you know, to serve the essential function of holding in your respiratory secretions around your face. Uh, you know, I mean, the cloth mask and the surgical mask kind of have a little bit of different purpose. You know, as hopefully you've seen before that the, you know, it, as opposed to an N95 that actually might be protecting you from um, others. <laughs> you know, the, the point of the surgical mask or the cloth mask is to hold your respiratory secretions around your face so that you're not, ex, ex, you know, ex, uh, spreading them through the air to others. So that's where, um, so it's just, it just requires a little bit of a change in mindset as to the purpose of those. And um, uh, I think that's, I think I'm all caught up. Sit here, one more Q and A. Oh, um, do you know if the original cases started with bats for sure or other animals? So my understanding from the genetic testing um, that they've done is that they are sure that it came from a bat, and that it's really only a a, a point mutation um, that occurred to um, to create the particular, uh, you know, to change it into being the the virus that we're seeing now and that has been become infectious to humans. So uh, as far as I know, that is, that is confirmed. All right, now I'm gonna go on to my next section, and this is the part I've been working on, <laughs> so I wanted to go ahead and tell you a little bit about um, hurricane season. I know this isn't a, strictly a veterinary topic, but uh, hopefully you all will be interested um, it, this has caused quite a bit of discussion, especially among the state health departments, uh, about getting ready for hurricane season this year. So, 
Um, as you can imagine, COVID-19 is really co coloring everything in our lives. And, uh, and, and it's thrown everything into question that we have developed guidance for in the past, including hurricane season. So, um, you know, some of our concerns are it's already predicted to be a more active year um, this year than uh, in the past, or, or than average, I guess. Um, and, you know, in spite of the stay-at-home orders, people may need to evacuate to shelters, and so we, we need to figure out how to do that safely. And then having all the concerns about shared living and crowded conditions, you know, how that would work with needing to maintain the social distancing and um, cloth face coverings that I mentioned. And so we did uh, about two weeks ago, um, release this interim guidance for um, disaster shelters. And, you know, you might want to take a look at that if, if this is an area that you could possibly get involved in. And so I'll, go into in a little bit more detail. So, you know, this is the view from Hurricane Katrina and the Superdome that you all may remember. And so you can see that this sort of shelter would not um, meet uh, the needs right now as far as social distancing and, uh, and, and all that type of thing. So this is, we definitely need to avoid this, this hurricane season. Um, even this sort of shelter, it looks much more organized, you know, not so crowded, but you know, you're still having beds quite close together and you're still, um, you know, having them in one big open room. And so we're trying to see if we can make some changes to, to provide a little bit more safety for people in, even in um, this sort of environment. So these are the questions that we started with. Um, you know, how do we lower the risk of transmission? How do we operate with while maintaining social distancing? You know, what strategies can we use to monitor for illness? Um, what do we do if someone gets sick? You know, and on and on. So um, I'll go through this a little bit. So these are all the areas that this guidance covers. And um, I will go through um, these in a little bit more detail. Um, the first thing we really, one of the big discussions was where should these uh, shelters be located? And as we, as I already alluded to, sort of the basketball arena scenario is not going to be a great uh, situation in this, in this year. So um, what we sort of landed on is the preferred option is hotels or dormitories. So the hotel census are, is down a lot right now, and so that provides some additional availability of hotel rooms, um, perhaps more than normally would be available. And then also with all the college dormitories being um, released early this year, those are a possibility. And so the good thing about this sort of setting is that it allows for um, separate rooms for each family, which can lower the risk of transmission. And instead of, you know, buffet-style feeding areas, you could deliver food to each room to help keep people separate. Um, and each room would have their own private um, bathroom and, you know, all, all the amenities. And so that helps to keep everything separate. So this is definitely the preferred um, option. Um, and then some of the other key points are, um, you know, that if it's a, if it's a lower grade, Storm that perhaps could recommend more sheltering in place. Um, if you know if that's a safe alternative, um, we are recommending that everyone wear a cloth face covering anytime they're out in the common areas. Um, and so they need to also remember to wear cloth face coverings with them. And then access to safe shelters is critical, and so. Um, we need to provide symptom uh, testing, and um, so there would be symptom checking each day, and then also providing an isolation area to keep people who are symptomatic in a separate area until they can receive medical care. Um, and then uh, I think, I guess I already mentioned about the symptom monitoring, uh, and then 
um, testing, if available, would be helpful for both the shelter staff and residents to understand what their, what their status is and what precautions they need to take. Um, and then, you know, again, all of the usual um, hygiene procedures and, you know, and, but also I guess the point that people should bring hand sanitizer and any sort of cleaning products that they would use at home, they need to bring with them to use in their area and to be able to keep themselves clean. And then, um, you know, we with after Hurricane Katrina, you know, it was known that there was an issue about pets, you know, needing to be able to put pets in shelters, and so we have the Pets Act in place. So the Pets Act procedure should all go along normally um, with this. The part we put into place was about, um, you know, perhaps just identifying one family member that would go to the pet area of the shelter every day and take care of their pet, just to try to limit. The number of people in and out of the pet area um, and you know that there be a hand washing station and you know um, that you can maintain the hygiene and um, cloth face coverings in that area so um, but otherwise it should still you know it should still go on as has been previously um, outlined about having a pet shelter in proximity to um, human shelters so, you know, this is not a perfect solution. You know, certainly as we've released this, several questions have come up and we've had to, um, you know, I mean, it is just gonna be a challenge this year and we're happy to help people work through this as they come up with, um, you know, in, as they're trying to actually implement this guidance about how exactly it's gonna work. You know, some of our concerns are that people might be afraid to go to shelters due to COVID-19 and not thinking that these social distancing and, you know, uh, symptom checking is in place. So we're trying to get out some social media messages about that, that, that we are addressing COVID-19 with this guidance this year. You know, concerns that there may not be enough masks or face coverings for everyone. And that's why we're encouraging people to bring them with them. Um, and that people might not comply with the social distancing and other preventive measures, um, you know, which it seems like there's kind of a rising tide of uh, weariness, let's say, with all, with all of these uh, precautions at this point. Um, and certainly there may be a heightened level of anxiety and the need for mental health providers. Um, and then we, we didn't really address the issue of transporting people to shelters. Um, and that's an issue that's come up a number of times. It's not something that CDC is really in charge of, but certainly we're in discussions with um, FEMA and ASPR and others about how exactly that um, could work in a safe way. And then just the concern that some staff or volunteers may be unable or unwilling to assist. And this stems from really, if you know anything about the American Red Cross volunteers, they tend to be retired folks. And so many fall into the category of over 65. And so, you know, that may make them unavailable for, um, for volunteering for shelter work this year. See, I've got a question about the Pets Act. What is the status of state capabilities, given that no funding was included in the legislation. It's, that is true. Um, each state is responsible for implementing the Pets Act, and I've heard some really, you know, great stories about, you know, how states have successfully implemented it, but you're right. It, I'm sure with, with no funding, it makes it, it makes it a more difficult, um, uh, it makes it more difficult. Um, let's see here. Oh, that was my last slide. So here's my contact information. If you have any questions that you don't want to ask now or something comes up on these topics later, you're welcome to um, ask. And um, with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, Tracy or Jeremy, I don't know if you usually do the raise hands method at all if you want to do that or or you want to just direct everyone to answer ask the questions in the q a box i'm fine either way jeremy are you on sure am yeah how do you guys usually do it uh, the the q a box is certainly a, a good way to go uh, it just helps not have to try to get things unmuted 
We do have two raised hands. But maybe it was accidental. Potentially. Well, I tell you what, we can go ahead and uh, open up the microphone for those folks if you'd like to do it that way. Sure. Do you see it? It's um, Danelle Bickett, Widow, and Sarah Hamer. Great. I tell you what, Sarah, uh, we can go ahead and uh, unmute your mic if you would like. And let's see here. And you can ask your question. Dr. Bickett Whittle didn't raise her hand. I think it may be by mistake, and the same oh. may be the case of Sarah. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, I do have another question. Oh, I did not so she did not raise her question. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, everybody. Buddy, if there's no questions left, um, Dr. Funk. I just got one more. So, will CDC release any more specific items for institutes of higher learning? Those of us at colleges of veterinary medicine are using CDC as a source for university policies as we approach the fall term. Yeah. Um, you know, we did come out with the reopening uh, institutes of higher learning guidance. So definitely take a look at that. Um, I'm not aware of more guidance being um, on the, you know, uh, in the batter box, so to speak. But that doesn't mean that it's not, um, that that's not possible. You know, if there's something specific you need, you know, certainly feel free to reach out and ask the question. I'd be happy to get your question to the right, right spot. And then the next question is, do you think sports events in high schools will happen this fall? Oh, that's a, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> that one. <laughs> there's just so many factors to consider. I mean, I really don't envy you know, school principals, uh, you know, at this point, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, it's just a little bit hard also to know what's going to happen with, um, you know, the virus in the fall. There's certainly been talk about a, a second wave, so to speak. And, um, you know, we're just going to have to watch and see. Um, certainly, you know, I, I watch a lot of the internal presentations from CDC and, um you know, there are different models, you know, showing, you know, I think most of the models do show a second wave. It's just a question of when it will happen. So, um, yeah, what, I think a lot of people think it might be similar to the, the flu season, you know, so that it would be sort of later in the fall. Um, but certainly everyone going back to school and sort of all getting back together again in August or September, you know, could could speed that up. So I'm just, I'm just conjecturing at this point. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I've got another question from Danelle about with the shortage of PPE and the request for veterinarians to cut back use of their normal PPE, will there be any evaluations of unintended consequences on other disease exposures in the veterinary profession? I think that's a great idea, and you do raise a good point. Um, I think it's, um, you know, something to keep watching over um, the the PPE supply. I have been hearing that N95s are getting easier to acquire, um, and so I definitely think people should keep keep attempting to order PPE. Um, and then, you know, I think your suggestion is a good one. I'd be happy to take that back to NIOSH or others um, about evaluating um, the, the other diseases that, you, that may be unintended, as, you're, as you mentioned. Um, Lene is asking, um, is, if the vaccine is any closer. I don't know that much about the vaccine studies. Those are really happening out of NIH and not CDC. Um, you know, just realistically, coronaviruses have been difficult to create vaccines for in the past. And so I think it's gonna be difficult again in this situation. Um, you know, I think what could, would, would, what will likely be available sooner is a treatment of some sort. 
And you know, remdesivir does seem to show some promise. It ha it is being used in clinical um, trials right now. Um, and I even know of people that have used it in the past for for FIP with with some success. So um, I you know I imagine that something like that or even just a protocol of you know this this sort of sim uh, symptomatic support it is helpful you know will become more publicized and will be helpful and you know that's something that could be useful this fall um, you know sooner sooner than later sort of thing um, the next question is hotels for sheltering in an evacuation event would these be FEMA fund would there be FEMA funding for those expenses some homeless shelters have done this on a small scale but with limited funding it's not sustainable yes so yes Hotels for sheltering in an event, in an evacuation event, um, can be supported by FEMA. Um, I don't remember the exact procedure, but it's, uh, it's usually part of your individual assistance. They call it the IA process with FEMA can include um, hotel expenses. And yes, I imagine for our homeless shelters that that's a, a difficult and, and not sustainable process because there's not a lot of there's probably not an external funding source um, for that. Um, the next question, um, is, are there suggestions and guidance on fitting respirators um, for N95s or higher? Yes, there is quite a bit of existing guidance on that. I would suggest you look um, at the website in particular, um, the um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, they've got some really good thing, good materials available there. NIOSH also has some good materials, so you can look there as well. Uh, I worked at NIOSH for many years, so it, you know it's near and dear to my heart. And I know that we had produced some simple posters and things that could be put up to help um, with donning and doffing and and things that might be helpful. Um, and certainly if you have access to a PAPR or a Last America or some sort of higher respirator that could be cleaned and reused, you know, that's, you know, certainly seems like that would be advantageous in this scenario where, you know, you're potentially going to be using a respirator for an extended period of time. Um, the next question is, have you seen information on the benefits of doing generalized screening Temperature and questions about exposure of people as they enter buildings compared to asking people to self-screen before going out in public. I have not, but that is a good uh, question, um, and I'm sure that that's something that CDC will be looking at uh, in the coming months because it is something that we're recommending. And um, you know, I'm thinking about it for myself, even as we, you know, CDC is starting to talk about our own staff returning to the office. You know, they are. We are planning to do symptom checks uh, and asking questions uh, every morning. And I'm just imagining that the line is going to be long to get into buildings every morning uh, to do that. And I would think that if you had like a symptom checker app of some sort, you know, would be a more a quicker, more efficient process. So anyway, um, we'll probably do it for our own benefit. If anybody else is. <laughs> um, next question, is there any research on how school closures, online learning options, and lack of socializing is affecting younger children? Certainly there's a lot of concern about that, and I, I know that that is a focus. I don't have any, any details about that, but um, we do have a children's health unit at CDC that's quite concerned about these topics. And I know that the academic, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, whatever field is, is, is looking at that as well. So I think more information will be coming out about that over time. Um, the next question is, when using respirators for extended time, is there an advantage of stepping up to an N or P100 filter? Um, really? Any of them are fine, you know, in the N, N95, R95, P100, you know, any of those work similarly. Sometimes, you know, there's been such a focus on N95 
that R9, I've, I've heard that R95s are a little bit more available. So I would say for the purpose, you know, of, of healthcare or veterinary care or whatever you're, you're needing a, a respirator for, that any of those would be fine. And so, you know, they're really the, the, you know, the P100 and R95 were really created more for manufacturing, you know, scenarios where they might be exposed to oil mists and things like that, that we, you know, don't generally worry about in, in um, healthcare settings, but, um, you know, any of those would work similarly and, you know, would be, be fine to use if you can get a hold of them.